Greetings. We return looking at the life and ministry of the famous Welsh Calvinistic Methodist exhorter, Mr. Hal Harris. I think this is our 14th message. And I was just delighted to find a book um, titled The Last Enthusiast. <laughs> it's a series of lectures uh, where the, uh, from the 1960s, and that's when the book was published, 1965. You'll see it up on your screen, the title that is. And what I want to do is I want to first draw some conclusions, be very brief. Then I want to make the argument from what comes from the lectures. And what we're going to specifically look at is where did, what was Hal Harris's tactic? Now that Christ has captured his heart, what was his tactic of ministry? Because I think it's very powerful and very important for us to remember. Where did his authority come from? And what was his priority? Okay? And by the way, his priority was having the very presence of God with him, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we're going to look at the tactic. We're going to look at where did his authority come from and his priority of the Holy Spirit being with him. Okay? First off, conclusions. What can we learn from this lesson? So I'm going to do the conclusions first and then the arguments why second. I want you to think about Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we will not give up. The times in which we live are incredibly challenging. But what I just said is true for every Christian age. There is constant opposition to God, to his son, to his spirit, to his word, to his church. Constant opposition. And there, this battle will not, until Christ returns and speaks a word to defeat all of his enemies, this spiritual battle is going to rage on. So I say to you, brothers and sisters, as well as to myself, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we will not give up. I am not concerned, and I hope you share this attitude with me, that when I leave this earth, um, if anybody remembers my name, there'll be a few family members. Maybe they'll talk about me once in a while. But I'm good with that. What I'm uh, principally concerned about is I don't want this world to forget the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want this world to forget the gospel message. That's my principal concern. I think it is yours as well. In this world, because of the spirit of consumerism, um, liberalism, um, the spirit of, of greed, of self-righteousness, the spirit of self-righteousness is, is, is just tremendous right now. The number of idols that we have to lead us astray, just the brokenness and lostness of this world in our respective governments, the vast majority of our politicians are serving themselves. What is right has become wrong and what is wrong has become right. And God is doing an amazing work right now in the midst of all of this. And he's doing this work what I see principally, by frustrating us. I mean, right now, and you've heard me say this before, and this comes from 1 John in Romans 1. Like, this world, the, the brokenness, the lostness, just the, the blindness of it all, this world is not only embracing sin, but it's, but it's practicing sin in order to get good at it. Yeah, we're going to embrace our sin, and we're going to keep doing it so we can get better at it. Because there's some fulfillment. There's something that they're trying to accomplish without God. And then 
not only are we doing that, but we're saying, hey, let's invent new ways to sin. And so not only are we going to commit sin, not only are we going to embrace it, not only are we going to get good at it, but we're going to invent new ways to sin. And then not only are we going to do that, but then we're going to boast about it. And the Lord says, no, you're not. I'm going to frustrate you. All these carnal promises that people are making, God is just squashing them time and time again, meaning that if there's any sense at all, any reasoning, you could see that time and time again people are making promises that they cannot keep. And so God is knocking down idols and he's knocking down ideas and notions, showing the vanity and the destruction of it all. It goes back to the verse, you know, the ways of man seem right to him, but they always lead to death and destruction. And so I thank God for that. And I thank God for lifting up uh, Christian men and women who are, who are bold, who are enthusiastic to, um, to proclaim the gospel, the prescription of saying, hey, I, I have a promise that can be kept by a person who never breaks their promises. The Lord Jesus Christ is capable. And I'm going to be reading uh, um, part of Hal Harris's sermon at the end of this message that will make that very point. So what can we draw from the examples that I'm about to give you this argument? Is One is that the ministry is really one-on-one. -on -one. I think it's important to, to see that. In other words, we can sometimes think about like ministry isn't worth it unless there's a, a large crowd. So a brother reminded me that he was a family reunion and he went to a wonderful church and the pastor preached biblically but with power. The Spirit of God was with him and he was just grateful for being there. And there was about a hundred souls there. It's a good sized church. But here they are laboring one by one. And I think that's important. That every that we're sensitive enough to know that every soul matters matters. Every soul. You know, the Christian faith, it's it's you know, it's not a you know, the, the door is narrow, meaning that it's one soul at a time that enters. Oh, the number can be infinite, but it's one soul at a time. And I think that's just really important that we remember and that as the Lord, and you have to think this through, be biblical, be sensible, make sure it's not your flesh, but of the Spirit, that if there's things that the Lord has impressed on your heart, then act on them. You know, it could be even as simple as the Lord has put on your heart to be grateful for your grandparents or your parents or your children or your friends or your minister, or your elders, or your deacons. But the Lord has, or a work colleague, or a neighbor, you know. But the Lord has put something on your heart. Listen to that. Listen to him. Search the scriptures. Think it through about how the Lord best wants you to act. But act. Don't grow weary of doing good. Think about what's happening around you spiritually. Seek the Lord in prayer, in fasting, and see what he would have you do about it. Do you know that Hal Harris wrote 3,000 letters? 3,000, 294 volumes of his diaries. What do you call that? An enthusiast. So what I'm saying is like, even if the Lord's pressing on your heart to write a letter then write the letter. You know, it, it, I just use this as an example, but, you know, if you're a young man and you're in love with a young girl, well, then go tell her. What are you waiting for? If you're a young girl and, you know, or, or older, it does, age doesn't really matter, but you will go love somebody, well, then go tell them. And, and my point being is, is, let's stop beating around the bush about what's on our mind, what's on our hearts. 
You can go tell your neighbors, you, you, you know, I know you're struggling with drugs, but it's never going to answer you. It's never going to cure you. You're just trying to escape. I've got a better way. Do, do you see what I'm trying to say? Go speak your mind. Politely, with, with respect, with being winsome, but also with firmness. And, and if at the end of the day there's just disagreement, well, then there is disagreements, and, and there is a cost to it. There isn't always an easy way. There won't always be, you know, in the in the immediate, you know, short term. Uh, yes, there may be conflict because there's disagreement. That's right. There's a spiritual battle that is going on, and this battle will not end until our Lord returns and speaks a word, and all of his enemies will be crushed. But remember. Go back to, is it Romans chapter 16? The devil will be crushed, right? So that's what we can learn from Hal Harris. So, so specifically, Hal Harris says during his conversion, because he writes about it a couple times every year in his journals, he says, I began speaking to souls one by one, then did read to them and had a gift of discoursing. The evening I spent with a few private friends whom the Lord had now touched their hearts, the fire of God did so burn in my soul that I could not rest day nor night without doing something for my God and Savior. I continued to go on exhorting the poor people. They flocked to hear me every Sunday evening. My friends were in hopes I should be cured of my enthusiasm, <laughs> as they called it, but the Lord Jesus had now got possession of my heart. So, this is 1735. This is before Hal Harris even knew Daniel Rowland, William Williams, um, even, I think even before Griffin Jones, uh, ever before meeting George Whitfield, John Wesley, Charles Wesley. He is preaching the gospel. Now, you may say, wait a minute. Every young person who comes to the Lord has this level of enthusiasm. And then it fades away. You know, like you grow up, you mature. No, no, not in Hal Harris's case. Mm -mm. This enthusiasm never ends. Oh, he has his challenges. He has his bad days. He gets he gets depressed. I mean, if if all the stuff that I mentioned in the past are thrown at you and said about you, well, you're going to have some bad moments as well. But nothing is going to curve this man. Now, if you ask me, you say, wait a minute. Now, John, can you give me, like, a, can you cite biblical evidence while eth enthusiasm is actually biblically sound? You know, this level of energy, you know. Well, of course, I could tell you, well, look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he set his mind to. But if you want to, like, the most intimate example that I could give you is read 2 Corinthians. I think it's Apostle Paul's most personal epistle. It tells you what's in his mind, what's in his heart, you know, his deep feelings about things. And what does it show? He's an enthusiast. How, how can he not be? Because the Lord has gotten possession of Apostle Paul's heart, just like the Lord has done here with Al Harris. So what I'm trying to say is this world is trying, because of the opposition, that is trying to eradicate the very memory of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the Christian church, or try to make the church ineffective by being mechanical or giving in to the spirit of this age. Like when I die, nobody's going to remember my name except a few family members. And I'm good with that. But what I don't want is I want is for Christ to be forgotten. I don't want this world to forget that there is a Savior who is capable of saving them. And I know you feel the same way. We have the prescription. It is called the Christian gospel. And so out of this, what I want you to see is, one, he's talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. He's having small groups at his mom's house. And this is going to continue on for the rest of his life. So yes, I do mention all the time about how hundreds, even thousands, 
would come to hear Hal Harris and others preach. But don't lose sight of the fact that Hal Harris was very concerned about setting up what we would call small groups or, or uh, community groups or uh, weekly Bible studies. But they were, um, uh, you know, they, they were uh, what they would call um, uh, spiritual groups. You know, that, that in other words, they would get together and they would fellowship and talk about the things that are really going on with their lives. These, these meetings that they would have, these spiritual meetings. You know, they could open it up by saying, okay, what spiritual challenges have you faced since the last time we got together? Anybody? Do you see what I mean? And if, and if a group got together and they were honest about it, they would talk about the spirit of self-righteousness, the spirit of consumerism, the spirit of money and greed and material possessions, the spirit of um, of selfishness, the, this uh, you know this uh, the spirit of individualism that has taken over us, the spirit of fear. Yes. So, this is like I said, this is going to continue on. And I want to bring to you the example of the way Hal Harris would talk to people and also preach. He would say, um, the content of his message did change, the author writes. Hal Harris says, or wrote, what I had in my view was to rouse all to fly from the wrath of God. So that's, that's how Hal Harris began. But by 1744, he says, my message is chiefly to preach Christ's kingly, kingly office, that is, and deliverance to the captives and weak. I see I have had every truth gradually, he says, that it's come to him over time. He wrote in 1761, looking back, first the thundering, then the spirituality of the law, then of Christ doctrinally, then inviting people to Christ, the forgiveness of sins and assurance. And again, that's often overlooked today, isn't it? Christian assurance. It's not, uh, you know, I was, I was sharing that we must not always think about the genuineness of our faith. Let's start with the genuineness of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be riddled with doubts at times. But if we look unto Christ and what he has promised, the one who doesn't break promises, that our Lord is capable, that our Lord is faithfulness. That as Daniel Rowland said in his sermon, the Lord does not grow weary of our sins. Mm -mm. He has compassion on us. He's gone to great lengths to save us. So my point is, in our weakness, we can find strength by totally trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have the humility to say to the Lord, Lord, I can't think of any reason at all that you should let me into heaven other than the person and the work and what Christ accomplished at the cross. That's the only reason I could think of that you would allow me into your celestial city. Th that, that should be our attitude. Yes, Christian assurance, by looking at what God accomplished. A year afterwards, holiness and pressing to perfection. Yeah. Hal Harris views sanctification as a process that as being born again, that the Spirit of God and the Word of God is cleansing us. Again, I go back to Romans 6, 17 all the time. And guess what? We're going to reflect God's glory in our lives. And Hal Harris said, yeah, that, that, that's because why wouldn't we want that? Because Christ has, a, has got possession of our heart. We're, we're serving a new king there's a new kingdom, there's a new language, there's a new culture. You know, if we were to go off live in a distant land, we would want to know everything about this new place that we're going to go live. And the new place that we're going to go live is called heaven. And in heaven, we love people and use things. And in this world, we use people and love things. And so that gets all flipped around. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And now all of a sudden we're loving one another and now we are growing in holiness and truth and grace and mercy and compassion and wisdom. Yes. 
And at times he wrote this, Our dear Redeemer's glory in believing in him and being honest with him is certainly the sum of my preaching. Just stop and think about this for a second. Our Redeemer's glory and believing in him. Hal Harris is making my point, or I'm making Hal Harris's point. What I'm trying to say is, it's not about your faith. It's about what God has done within you. He gets all the glory. I trust in him entirely, and if we don't, we're done. If God doesn't keep his promise, we're done. There's no way to get back into the Garden of Eden. There's, what, there's angels there. They have flaming swords. If you can't get back to the Garden of Eden, how on earth are you ever going to get into heaven? I can't think of any other way other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We need his righteousness. We need his life. We need the Spirit of God within us. This power. Not power in the sense of, like you hear in these silly movies, but the very person of God within our life. The life of God is in our soul. We have this intimacy with God now. We see things fresh and anew. And Al Harris is honest. There's, that's the solution, my friend. The, the solution is not to pretend that we're something that we're not. The solution isn't to behave like the, the Pharisees. So this is really important. Hypocrisy isn't simply saying something about yourself that's not true, right? You're doing the complete opposite. Hypocrisy also includes, let me do just enough to get by. Let me do just enough to get by. To satisfy God, to satisfy my pastor, let me do just enough to get by. As Hal Harris is growing, he writes in his diaries that um, you know that he's writing about you know he's writing about himself, like most diaries, right? And it, things that he's interested in, but his entries are including all sorts of things like. He asked the Lord about buying a pair of gloves. Had freedom to ask his will if he should take tea. Waited to know the Lord's mind about coloring my dear wife's gown. When you're growing in holiness, you become more sensitive about the decisions that you're making in your daily lives. Do I feel convicted when I read these things? Oh, yes, I do. I feel as if Hal Harris's, like my faith has, has absolutely nothing you know, in common with Hal Harris's faith. In other words, that the love of the Lord that he had for the Lord is something I cannot relate to. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But I want to. I want to be more like this brother. Don't you want to be more like this brother? You know, where do you, the next breath you take, you thank you, Lord. Lord, how should I spend my time, my, my resources? Lord, this clean water that I get to drink? Thank you, Lord, for the people that I have in my life. Thank you for the simple joys that in this mad, mad world, the beauty of your nature, the love that I do see, for God's common grace restraining evil. Thank you, Lord. And though you may slay me, as Job says, I trust in you. So, Hal Harris is, is honest. He's honest. He's not a hypocrite. And where does his authority come from? Because did he, didn't he not want to be ordained? I was reminded, I thought it was two times, but it's actually four times. And he would speak to others about it, including Lady Huntington and George Whitfield and Daniel Rowland. And, but it came down to this issue that he says um, that, that he couldn't be ordained because, because they could not give in to one of his demands. And Hal Harris's demand was, I said I could not be confined. You must allow me to go about so why wasn't Hal Harris, which he wanted, he wanted to be ordained. 
He wanted that respect. He wanted that acknowledgement. I am a minister of the gospel in the established church. He wanted that, without a doubt. But they said to him, you're a minister, you're going to stay within your parish that we assign you. And he said, no. I must go about. You cannot confine me. And did that bother Hal Harris? Sure. But where did Hal Harris's authority come from? Well, it came from the Lord. Because he was preaching the gospel, sharing faith, uh, going about doing good, not growing weary, but going about doing good, well before meeting Daniel Rowland, William Williams, George Whitfield, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, as I mentioned before. His authority came from God, and that's what he ended up having to rest upon. He wasn't a nut. He was an enthusiast. He wasn't misguided. He just really loved the Lord. Who can criticize that? So that's where his authority came from. What was his priority? His priority in his preaching was that he would judge his preaching based on the power in other words, in the power is the third person of the Holy Spirit, meaning that the very presence of the Holy Spirit within the service is how he judged the service. So he even writes, I'm trying to find, oh, here it says right here, he says, um, in all of my discourses, before the power comes, I open the context. <laughs> I got to love that. Okay, okay, all right. In all my discourses, before the power comes, I open the context. So what is he saying? Yeah, I just expound the scriptures. Like, in other words, eh, kind of like a Bible study. You know, I, I read the scriptures, I start explaining the scriptures until the power comes, which is the very presence of the Holy Spirit. So we're not just talking about some mystical force. We're talking about a person. I, if God doesn't come in here to illuminate his word, to grip our hearts, then we're done. Okay? And so that's how he judged it. It doesn't mean that God didn't do some work in each service, but he wasn't saying, like, oh, I felt really good about today's sermon because many complimented me on it. Or I felt really good about it because I con conveyed truth. Okay? And those things are not, not bad. They're good, right? We want to convey truth, right? We want, it's nice to know that people are blessed by it. But Hal Harris's, the way he would judge a sermon, and it is subjective, so you can't be lead to error on this, but was God with me? He preached one time, I think it was 10 times, on the last words of Ezekiel. Do you know what the last words of Ezekiel is? God is there. I think that's right. God is there. And Hal Harris preached, Ten times doing that. I'm just looking to looking at Ezekiel now. You look it up too. And it says here, the Lord is there. <laughs> the Lord is there. Four words. The Lord is there. And he's going to preach on it like ten times. <laughs> okay? So what do you call that? You call that an enthusiast. Enthusiast. <laughs> That's what you call that. Now we're, we're going to bring this to an end. So I'll... My encouragement is think about these things. What can you draw on? And what I'm trying to say is there is no task too small. Everything we do is important. That letter, that conversation, giving out a copy of a Bible, giving out a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, giving a friend a good Christian biography. Hey, I know that you're thinking about giving up on the ministry. I've got this biography on Daniel Rowland, just published by Banner Truth. Here's a copy for you. Hey, I know you're struggling with drinking and drugs. I know you're worried about your children. Can I pray with you about them? Would you like to come to my weekly, you know, community group? A private spiritual meeting where we talk about the things of the Lord. 
And what we say in there and what we pray about stays within that room. We, we are not here to embarrass people. We're here to help people. It all matters. Well, I'm on the 30-minute mark. So it's December, September 20th. And Hal Harris is preaching on Matthew 11, verse 28. And it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor. O glorious news, glad tidings indeed. Will you not hear? Will you be angry when you are called from hell to heaven, from darkness to light, from the devil to Christ, from bondage to liberty? Christ calls you. Will you not come to be pardoned, to be healed, to be washed, to be presented to the Father? O glory of this word, John, I don't know what to tell my neighbor and friends and family. Well, you can tell them to come to Christ. Are you really going to be angry? Are you really going to be disappointed going from hell to heaven, from darkness to light, from the devil to Christ, from bondage to liberty? Christ calls you, will you not come to be pardoned, to be healed, to be washed, to be presented to the Heavenly Father? O oh, glory of this word, come. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say, clean yourself up and then come to Christ. You can go tell your family, friends, this world, this message. This does communicate the gospel message. Yes, I think there's much that we can learn from Mr. Hal Harris. I think he's a remarkable Christian brother. And... I think it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian enthusiast. And we'll continue on the subject next time. Until then, grace upon grace be with you all.